Ross, thank you so much for coming. It's really nice and sweet of you. We uh, have to tell you also that the program here is sponsored through a grant. I'm supposed to say these words. It's a little hard to remember. From the Wyoming Cultural Trust, a program of state parks and cultural resources. There we go. Um, so we're going to start with a tune called Egoak Choria Chori. The high school students know this. We played it last night, didn't we, for the college group, Choria Chori? This is a tune that was written in the 1960s during the dictatorship, the Franco dictatorship in Spain. You all know probably that the Basque country is a small nation along the Atlantic coast where France meets Spain in the Pyrenees Mountains. Part of it's in the southern, the southern part of it's governed by Spain, the northern part of it's governed by France. But the Basque people predate any French or Spanish nation. They predate the Roman Empire. I just got handed tonight a little cutout article of the hand of Iru, Irulegi. It's called the Irulegi Go Eshkua, Hand Eshkua. And we could talk about that later. It's a remarkable discovery that puts back into earlier time what we know about written language for Basque people. It puts it back to 2,100 years ago with wow. absolute evidence that they were written documents in Basque that long ago. So this tune, though, arose in the 1960s, was written by a man named Mikel Lapoix, and it was written in response to the suppression of all things Basque under the Franco dictatorship. That included playing Basque music, which was illegal in Spain at that time, speaking the Basque language. Oh, let me teach you something then. Can you say the word caixo? And uh, Sermodus? Oshondo? Okay, now you got a whole conversation. <laughs> the conversation is you, you greet one another, and somebody says, Kaisho, and the other person, that means like, hi, how are you doing? Somebody else says, Kaisho, back, and then somebody says, what did I just teach you? Not you, them. Oh. <laughs> Sermodus, say that again. Sermodus, and the answer is Oshondo. So, Sermodus, how are you doing? Oshondo, very well. Okay, you ready? I'll ask you the question. We'll do the whole conversation. Kaisho. Sermodus. <laughs> so, that was illegal in the 1950s, 60s, until 1975 when Franco died. It was illegal to publish a book in Basque. It was illegal to do a Basque folk dance. It was illegal to have radio or television broadcasts in the Basque language. And out of that arose this song called Choria Chori, meaning the bird is a bird, or Egoak, the wings. And the song's lyrics, can any of you remember the lyrics in English? Any, anybody? Can you say them in English at all? No? The, look, you're in the back. You have something. You have it written on your phone, right? You want to tell us? No. The lyrics are this. Had I cut your wings, you would never have flown away. You would have been mine forever. But had I cut your wings, you would no longer have been a bird, and it is the bird that I love. Yeah. All Basque people know this song now. It's an anthem of the Basque people, and you can see why they would care about not cutting the wings of the bird that they take themselves to be. So, are we ready for it? Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
sitting in front of the gentleman who played tuba and baritone saxophone, you didn't see that they were swaying slightly. They were much more vigorous swayers in high school. But here they were swaying in a more dignified and gentle fashion. But still I was interested because you know the tunes in three beat, like a waltz, doom cha cha, doom cha cha, and that tends to make us sway. I don't know why. We're going to ask someone someday, why do we feel that longing to sway in three? Do you have an answer to that question? Okay, so we'll press onward. Um, we're going to show them that old ancient instrument now. Tell them about that, Kevin. This instrument is like an emblem of the Basque people. It is one of the one of the very very ancient instruments. They have a number of instruments that are very ancient. We're talking about thousands of years. And, uh, the oldest flute, I think, is was found in some of the Basque country. play a traditional fandango, an old one called Loreac, which means the flowers.
want a little bit of more information, and then maybe you might have something you want to say to us. I mean, we're not like, you know, in a football stadium where we can talk to one another and all that kind of stuff, but we're actually doing the cultural trust part of this. What they were interested in is a book that was published in 2020 to bring into English for the first time the poems and songs of a 19th century Basque troubadour named Yoshe Mari Iparraguirre. That'd be a good word to say aloud. Iparraguirre. And Yoshe Mari was a kind of a oh, unbelievably famous figure then and now in the Basque country. And the songs he wrote, many, many of them, there are 39 pieces of music and poetry that we have, that we know, are written by him. There are some things, you know how when things are old and it's a little murky, there's doubt. Maybe he wrote that, but the 39 that we did for the book, we know absolutely he wrote. And in 1820, when he was born, the Basque country was still pretty much independent. His parents moved from the Basque country, the province of Guipuzcoa, to Madrid in Spain, so that their son could go to a Jesuit preparatory school to become a priest. But in 1834, the Carlist Wars broke out. These were wars of succession over the crown of Spain, and it was a huge fight over what people thought of as maintaining the older ways. Spain as a kind of confederation of peoples versus trying to create a unified, more modern, industrialized Spain, which to those who wished that, they thought they would model on the French state following the French Revolution, a more industrialized, mercantile, business-oriented. And they thought if they could make sure that the crown went to their favorite, their favorite being the six-month-old baby daughter of the dead king. And of course, at that time in Spain, it was illegal for a girl child to become ruler of Spain. So they had to change laws. And there was a huge fight where the dead king's brother, Juan Carlos, he thought he'd be the king. War breaks out. Our hero, Yoshe Mari Parraguirre, goes runs away from home at age 14. Let's run really quick. Baritone sax down to the other end. How old are you? 18. 18. 18. Look at this. These guys are ancient men compared to Yoshe Mari, who was 14 years old when he ran away and joined the Carlos armies where he fought for four years in what was a terribly bloody and difficult war, and at the end of which, the people who supported Juan Carlos, which were the Basques, because that would have supported Basque freedom and independence, they lost. Yoshe Mari fled with lots of other people to France where he was for 10 years, and in 1848, he was a participant in the French Revolution. And some of you may know of that secondary one, the whole problem in France of Napoleon uh, ruling through monarchy, back to republic, back to monarchy. That lost too. I joked last night that Yoshe Mari was a fellow who was really, really capable of always being on the losing side of every conflict there ever was. So in 1848, he fled Paris, he went to Toulouse, which isn't far from the Basque country in southern France, where he was arrested by the French government and kicked out of the country. He went to England. In 1852, a Spanish general, are you okay when I tell you all this history? I hope so. In 1852, a Spanish general heard him play music and loved the music and came to know and like Yoshe Mari. So he arranged a pardon with the Spanish government. Yoshe Mari went back to Spain, but he, he didn't go to the Basque country where he lived. He went to Madrid where there was an exile Basque community living in Madrid. And in Madrid, with the piano player at a bar that he worked in regularly, he, he made his living almost entirely playing in bars and clubs. The piano player, along with Yoshe Mari, wrote this tune called Guernica Coarbola. The Guernica Coarbola is the tree of Guernica. And this is a tree under which all the rulers of surrounding states came for hundreds of years and bowed down and swore fidelity to the Basque government and its freedom and autonomy. After the Carlos Wars, that was over. The rising new Spanish state, we are done with that. The Spain is going to be unified and it's going to be one thing. So the, the tree of Guernica, his song became super popular in the Basque country, sung everywhere. I think that's what I'll tell you about it. We'll play it. And then, oh, it's funny, everywhere I go and tell people about the tree of Guernica, they always ask me, what kind of tree was it? And so I'll tell you, it was not a palm tree. It was an oak tree. This is the Guernica Co Arbola.
in. Yoshimari would never plug in anything. <laughs> he, he might have a good Are you ready? Form 
with regulations that were meant to go across the language in the 1960s. And then at the fall of Franco, at the death of Franco, they were able to put that in place. So schooling, as I mentioned, it was illegal to go to school in the Basque language. Now you can't. Parents in the Basque country can choose to educate their children 100% in Basque, with Spanish as a foreign language, or French, or English. Many Basque parents are now choosing English as the second language, and Spanish or French as the third, which was a reversal. And part of that's because the kids are surrounded by everything in Spanish or French anyway. You know what I mean? So if you're living in the Basque country, you're going to learn Spanish in the South or French in the North. Um, but we, had, we were so interested in doing these, and yet I was trying to figure out, because a lot of what I know, I know the language is called Batua. I'm an adult learner. An adult learner is called an Euskal Berria, which means a new living Basque human being. <laughs> and people who are born to the Basque country and grew up in the culture and grew up with the language are called Euskal Zaharra, an old Basque person. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be an old bass person when you're five, and you can be a new bass person when you're 95. You know? yeah. So I'm a new bass person, and they treat Basque identity as a function of language. If you speak the language and you wish to be integrated, you will be considered Basque. It's not any beef about who can and who's allowed to say I'm a Basque. If you speak the language. So anyway, it was a little tricky with these because they predate the modern language. And I've just now finished uh, the second book, which is the oldest known Basque published printed material of music and poetry. They go back to the 14th and 15th centuries. Boy, you don't want to get tangled up in that one. It is like, whoa, what language are we on? Not even Basque as I know it. So here's that thing, the uh, Guernica Coarbola, the Tree of Guernica. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention, and Daniel pointed this out to me, I hadn't said it before. I'm only going to read you three of the verses, the three that are in the song. Uh, Yoshimani wrote many, many, many verses of this poem. But musicians almost always play just these three, because otherwise you'd have to sit here all night, and you're only going to sit here part of the night, as they always make fun of me for laughing at you so much. Uh, but here it is, the tree of Guernica, the three you heard. Blessed tree of Guernica, beloved by Basque, Fruit given to the world, we adore you, holy tree. On our knees, let's ask God to give our tree eternal life. And if we ask sincerely, it will be so, now and forever. Let us pray to God above for peace, now and always, that our land be strong, and that the Basque country be blessed. So you can see he was quite the Basque patriot from this time period. But that's only one of his kinds of work. Another kind that he wrote. I think we're putting it next, are we now? Yeah. Yes. This is, um, I joke that often he seemed to write about either patriotism, love of the Basque homeland, longing for Basque freedom, that kind of thing, or he wrote about uh, Basque linguistics, Basque cultural identity, that kind of stuff, or he wrote songs making fun of the kind of stupidity he seemed to exhibit in his love life. <laughs> and there are a whole bunch of those. This one is called Sugana Manuela, which means about you, Manuela. And uh, I'll just read it to you. You know, you'll have to put up with hearing the Basque in the beginning. And then I'll read it to you as with the other one in the English translation. Are we ready? I love this one, by the way, so I hope you like it. I just think, I actually love an awful lot his wackier ones. I guess yeah. don't tell David if you don't like it. Thank you. 
countryside in Pyrenees Mountains, where he was performing, it is said, for a crowd of 60,000. 6,000. Sorry, sorry, 6,000, which is still pretty unbelievable. And Kevin likes to point out, well, it's not really all that unbelievable. After all, here we are, 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not really sure. But it was a lot of people, and the Spanish state was concerned. And so this Spanish senator wrote a report back to the Madrid government. And in his report, he said, notwithstanding the fervor and sincere love of Yoshimari Padre Aguirre for our Lord and the faith, and for Spain, because Yoshimari got, he had no real beef with Spain. He was happy to be the Spanish ambassador. He, he said, even so, whenever he plays this Guernica for Arbola thing, the Basque people, they take their berets off, they get down on their knees on the ground, they put their faces <laughs> under the ground, and they swear fidelity and loyalty forever to Basque independence, no matter what. So he said, kick him out of the country. He's got to go. So they kicked him out again. He was taken from the port of Bayonne, Bayona, in the northern Basque country, southern France. And he went by boat to Montevideo in Uruguay. Then he lived in Argentina. He was gone 18 years. And after 18 years, a newspaper man in Basque country wrote an article, Where is Yoshimari? And people thought he was dead. What happened to him, this famous figure? And people started looking around, doing some tracking and record keeping. They thought, oh, he's alive. He's not dead. He's alive in Argentina. So they got up a subscription. They paid his fare back to the Basque country, where the Basque governments of Guipuzcoa, Biscaya, and Araba all gave him a lifelong pension. Oh. I mean, like, it's as though they invented social security for him. <laughs> <laughs> Each, all three of them. And he got a permanent stipend then for the rest of his life. And the Farwa, the southernmost Basque province, they wouldn't give him a lifelong pension. They gave him a one-time payment. <laughs> so he's living in the Basque country with friends. His wife and kids, he had eight children, were in Argentina. He apparently was thinking about trying to save money and get them over there on his own. But he was with friends and had dinner one night at a farmhouse. Friends knew where he lived. And after they played music, they sang, they recited poems, they ate, they drank. And when it was over, he goes to walk home, but it was pounding rain. And in the rain, he came to a little creek where there was a spillway above it that had flooded. So it's flooding down to the creek where he is, and the little bridge, wooden bridge, is completely covered with water and slick. And imagine it's midnight, one in the morning, and he I couldn't. I said he had some alcohol in his system. Thank you, Marva. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. I bet he had some alcohol. <laughs> and so he couldn't cross. He was struggling, and he fell in the water, and he got back out, and he tried a different place upstream a little where there was some rocks. He, in the end, he gave up. He could not cross this little raging, now raging creek, and he went back to his friend's farmhouse. He got back completely soaked, and um, it was in the late winter, early spring. It, it can be cold. It's not cold like here cold, but if it's 36 or 38 degrees and raining, and you're soaked, it's cold. So he got back to the house, and he thanked, but everything was closed. These are farmhouses. Picture, you know, it was 1881 when he died. He was 61 years old. Nothing's open. There's no electricity. There's no bell. People are shuttered. They shuttered everything. You may know in vast traditional farmhouses, they're usually multi-floor, and the ground floor is for the animals, and the humans live on the floor above. So nobody answered. He finally gave up that, and he went to sleep in the pigsty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't so plain for Yoshimari. <laughs> he was awakened in the morning, found by one of the householders, chattering, completely you know, blah, 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 unable to do much. They picked him up, they took him in, they called the doctor. He died within, I can't recall, just three days or five days. Diagnosed with pneumonia. His last will was to give everything he owned to his wife and kids. And I don't know if they transferred the cemeteries from the province. As far as I know, the only property he had would have been his clothing, a few household artifacts, and the guitar that he always played. That's his story. Pretty good story, isn't it? Any comments? Any questions? Are you sure? Okay, we'll play another one. <laughs> Sounds cold. Sounds what? Cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we played one fandango, Lorea. Yeah. And we'll play you now what is the accompanying, traditional accompanying song that goes with fandangos. It's called an arin. And arin are fandangos.
Fandangos are always in three, really fast, or six, according to who tells you the story. And Ariens are always ducometer. So they're going to go one, two, three, four, or one, two, one, two, that kind of thing. This one is called Compostelaco and Romesha. And it's about two young Basque men wanting to go to Santiago de Compostela in, uh, in Galicia. Do you all know about the Camino de Santiago? Where people, pilgrims have walked uh, historically from Avignon, which was where the papacy was and, uh, when Italy was in the Warring States period and there were two popes, one in Rome and one in Avignon. And the, the trail started in Avignon and went over the Pyrenees, right through the village most Wyoming Basque people in the north, in Buffalo, came from, Arnegi. And it comes down into what's now Spain and goes across the northern part of Spain to Galicia, to Santiago. And there's a cathedral and big ceremony. So these young men are ostensibly going to uh, take the pilgrimage and be in Compostela. But they don't actually ever quite get there. Because when they get to Galicia, they meet two young Galician women. Uh, it's kind of reminiscent of some of the other songs, isn't it? And so the song is about that meeting. And when they meet the two young women, one of the things that happen is the young women see them and shout, Gore um, Euskadi! Which means, long live the Basque country, up with the Basque country. And the young men shout, Viva Galicia Sebe! Which was an independence political party in Galicia in the 1980s and 90s. So now we're in the realm of politics. And they decide that they will start the revolution together, the four of them. So they're spreading. They say the revolution starts and widens and spreads from one tavern to the next. Yeah. And then finally they say, we actually never got to the cathedral. We never got there at all. We never got anywhere near what we meant to get to. And the last verse, though, many Basque songs do this, where they're quite comedic, and then at the end they get serious. Or filled with sentiment in some way. And the end of this one is, even though I don't play the gaita, Kevin over here is going to tell you something about that in a bit, even though I don't play the gaita, I feel myself to be Galician, Gallego, Galego. And isn't it an amazingly beautiful thing every once in a while to allow yourself to change nation, nations and become someone else? I, I quite like this one too. <laughs>
to get him on the way out. His name is Brent Rose. Uh, yeah, and this is our daughter, Caitlin Rombet. So we're really happy to be here. We do, the three of us, of course, are part of the Bass community of Northern Wyoming, and Kevin and Daniel are musician friends of ours who have helped us with this music and play a lot of this with us and have made a recording. We have a recording of this ensemble, this five-piece ensemble called Oshpa. Oh, I should tell you the meaning of Oshpa because it's just some weird foreign word. Oshpa comes from the Basque verb Oshpatu. Oshpatu means to celebrate, to have a good time, to have a party. So you can Oshpatu many kinds of things. And an Oshpakisun is a celebration of some kind. Oshpechua is a famous person. But Oshpa, in its shortened form, is a command thing that old Basque people always use with their children and grandchildren. And it means, get out of my sight. So they would shout, Oshpa! And if they wanted to really reinforce it, they would shout, Oshpa Emendik! Emendik means from right here, from here, out there, gonzo. Oshpa. So uh, we love that it has this double meaning, Oshpatu and Oshpa. Maybe we could call it Celebrate Scramdom, something like that. So we're going to play one more of the Yoshimani tunes. This one's um, about his exile, his experience of exile. It's called Gaste Gaste Tatika. It's sometimes also called Agur Euskal Herriari, which means greetings to the Basque country, or the other form, Gaste Gaste Tatikan, just means in my youth. And it's about leaving the Basque country and then feeling like maybe it wasn't the best thing he ever did to leave the Basque country and his longing to go home. Gaste, gaste, tatika, me rindica, pura. Estranería de ella, pasa de demora. En real de gustia, tanto que o le va a dirá. Baña, vio, se vio, 
what has happened more is that many of the children and grandchildren of those Andalusian immigrants in the Franco era are now among the most ardent Basque nationalists. Uh, 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 Pardon me? Kind of yeah, kind of backfired a little bit. But it's, there's some really beautiful and charming parts because many, many people, again, in the Basque country, if you gave them their choice, they got no beef with Spain and France. They just would like to be able to control their own lives. You know? it's, it's like we don't have to hate Spaniards or the French or anything like that. It's just that please let us make our decision. Kind of. So, um, uh, let's see. The, oh, I have to read this poem right before I, before I read it. I forgot. We'll even forget the poem in Costa Rica for you. But there's one thing I'll tell you before I read it, which I love, so I don't forget this. It's that one of the children of these Andalusian immigrants, a little group of them, they came from flamenco musician families. You've all heard flamenco music recorded maybe? And they now play flamenco basque music. It is the wildest, craziest thing. <laughs> They play guitars in a style of flamenco guitar, but they sing. For example, you can look up this song I said to you, Choria Chori, remember that, the first one, Choria Chori, also called Egoa. If you look that up on YouTube as a video, you will find many, 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 many bands and people, choruses and schools and everybody singing it, but you will also find the flamenco bass band doing Egoa. It's really wild. Okay, here's the, uh, we already read Tugana Manuela, didn't we? We're now to read Gaste Gaste Tatican. Here it is. Greetings, Euskal Herria. Just a kid, I took off for foreign lands. I've spent my time here and there, and while it's true there's good everywhere, my heart tells me to go home. The land I love, it's right here. My mother, my friends, I could cross. I cross the ocean to see the new world. Now listen. So long, beloved mother of my heart. I keep in mind that, God willing, I'll soon cross the ocean again. So why cry, mother? What for? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of pretty sweet in an oddball way. <laughs> it's really fun translating these, and of course, my goal is to make them feel like English now. Uh, should we go ahead and play this? Are you yeah. okay with it? Yeah? So this is... Um, this is a tune. Did we play this in the high school? We played Nor Nori Nor this morning. I can't remember. I don't remember either. Yeah, yeah. One of the yeah. Yeah. yeah, isn't it time for Nor Nori Nor? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Margo's going to play this. I guess I'll endure playing it. Yeah, yeah. Oh! Okay, so that's pretty good. Not too Most of the time, it's not actually good with Margo. So this one is called Nor Nori Nor. And it's a song about politics, grammar, the Basque police and the Basque government, all tangled up together. It's very funny, typical Basque in some ways. It's very hard to learn Basque if you're a non-Basque speaker. It's very unlike the surrounding languages. It is the only language in Western Europe that is not either Roman, you know, Romance language roots, such as Spanish, French, Italian, Provençal, Gallego, Catalan, Portuguese, uh, Romanian, all these. They're all Romance-derived languages, but not Basque. And neither is it Indo-European. That's the weirder thing, because everything's Indo-European in Western Europe except Basque. So it's quite a wild thing. It's different. The structure, it's like, what? <laughs> I don't get it. And when you learn the language, you have to learn it through about 16 different cases for words. There aren't prepositions. Words like through, of, above, below, those words don't exist. They're all tacked on particles to other words. And you have to learn all the relationships. In some ways, it's a bit like Latin that way, but it isn't structured in the same way as Latin. <laughs> so you start learning nor first, all the forms in the language of nor. You know what a helping verb is, young men? A helping verb? It helps the sentence. <laughs> 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 well, it does help the bird somehow. That's why we call them that. They're called in Basque, la gusalia, which means friendly thing. And so they are the verb that modifies the root verb. So we have a verb to eat, right? And you can say, I eat, I will eat, I would eat, 
I would have eaten, I will have eaten, I had, all those are the helping verbs. The verbs eat. But all those other ones change. Are we in the future? Are we in the past? Are we imagining it might happen? All that. So Basque has all of that, but about, I asked a Basque teacher once, how many helping verbs are there in Basque? He said, I don't know, infinity. Because you can just keep building and inventing new ones for different relationships to bring apart. So the Basque language is just always evolving? Yeah. It can grow and change all the time. But it's super structural. It's like a big architectural form because there's this chart of the helping verbs of like La Gustalia. It's just almost all students have it because it goes going up. <laughs> um, and it's got probably, I don't know, maybe 500 helping verbs on it in this chart. So you kind of have to learn to tell it. So one of the things they're saying in the song, I'll tell you the lyrics of the song are, oh, and it's got Spanish dirty slang in it. Too. You don't remember that? No. I must not have played it. No, you no. didn't. Well, what were you guys doing? Sleeping there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were swaying too. We were swaying too much. So, anyway, the, the lyrics are the best government says it doesn't have enough money for the social services we really need. Isn't it odd that the money they don't have is ours? I think that's a good line. And then the person, they say, we've had it up to here. Would you like to know how to say, I've had it up to here? Can you say that? Otro teraño. Otro teraño. They say that, I've had it up to here. And then they use the Spanish slang word, poder. Which I will not translate. If there are any Spanish speakers in here, you can chuckle to yourselves about it. We use that. And then the next verse is, the Basque police force has bought a fantastic helicopter. But what on earth? What are they going to do with the helicopter? <laughs> and do they know how to fly it? <laughs> so then we're fed up some more in the next verse. And finally they say, we know the subjunctive and the conditional. You all know that in languages. You have to learn the conditional tense and the subjunctive tense. So it's funny. We know the subjunctive and the conditional. Nor, nor, nor. We know the conditions under which we live. So they make this pun about conditional grammar tense. Whoa, what an explanation, huh? Okay, here it is. Nor, nori, nor. That's amazing. Oh, you can sing the words. Nor, nori, nor. You can hear that for the first time if you wanted it. Oh, 
Olá, só a para tua. Essa nega que eu chido te, Cristo de helicóptero a, banha certa com a luta. Olá, só a para tua, banha. Las chico, chico, no te vayas, no te vayas nunca, no te vayas nunca, no te vayas nunca, no te vayas nunca. Yeah, that's a very common Basque name, Nechar. 
And Martin Etchart, who lives in Phoenix now, has written two beautiful novels uh, about Basque life. And he teaches at, or did teach at, what's the little college down there? Grand Canyon College, I think it's called. Anyway, he wrote a novel called Arizona, The Good Oak. Arizona is where the name Arizona came from, the Basque word for good oak, Arizona, because many of the first European settlers through there were Basques into the southwest, the Spanish colonized region. Um, and then there are communities littered around in other places, too, but those are the ones that people would know of, where you might find a Basque restaurant or a Basque event, that kind of thing. But the oldest Basque club in the United States is New York City. And then another big one is Miami, Florida, where they play high lie and gamble like crazy in Basque sports. <laughs> okay, over here. Yes, over here. So I wouldn't imagine that a saxophone or a piano were traditional Basque instruments. And then also tell us about your accordions. Yeah, um, the saxophone is not so unknown. It's actually been used a fair amount since its invention, but it was only invented in the 1860s. So it can't be that big a part like the alboca. It's very old, and the Shistu Flutie mentioned the 28,000-year-old flute that's the same design and size as the ones made and played now. The accordion was invented in the 1820s and came to the Basque country in the 1860s with Italian railroad workers. And they brought it, they came because they were building tunnels through the Pyrenees Mountains for railroads, the first modernization. And the Basque people liked the instrument, it was noisy, it was good for outdoor use, uh, it was festive. Uh, some people think it actually kind of has a happy sound. I don't know whether that's true or not, but you know, people say that. And this particular kind is called a trikitisha. Uh, which is the best name for this kind of instrument. It's different, that's why we have the two of them. When Yoshe Marie Farraguerre was alive, this instrument had not yet been invented. And the, this one had been, but he would never have seen or used one, I don't believe. He played guitar only, and then played in clubs with piano players. So the piano was used, not for the dance music, that party fandango arin that I mentioned, because you can't hold a piano out in the woods, in the mountains, in the valleys for parties. So they didn't use the piano, but it existed within their frame, as did the violin. It was a big part of Basque music until the accordion came along and drove it out by sheer volume of noise making. But now, Kevin likes to tell, tell them about Arcaïs. We have a friend named Arcaïs Miner who's uh, <clears throat> been bringing back the Basque violin. And uh, he's played with an uh, accordion player, wonderful, Jose Latapia, who said, come on, play this music. And he started playing it, it's wonderful. He also started playing the music of the alboca, that, that little instrument I was playing there, because that, that music just fits very well. It's got a good unusual scale that you can reproduce on the violin. So he's playing that music with incredible technique. He's a wonderful player. And then doing research about the history of violin, trying to find something about violin, and he just almost fell off his chair. He was reading an old journal that said that the albocari that he could play in the albocas, usually he'd play out of the somebody playing the bandero singing and then an alboca player. We'd play out in the streets for dancing all day. Well, this little passage said, and then they'd go in the pubs at night and play their violins. So he said, they were here. That was sort of written proof that what, of what he knew in his heart, that they had violins. And turns out they had a lot of violins and a lot of music. So we, we first heard, my daughter and I, Sheila and I heard the violin and accordion player. Wasn't it the first time we talked to you in Arcaïs, Bravo? Mm -hmm. And we were kind of stunned because we have played in many traditions of North American music in which the button accordion and the violin are central instruments together, and like that. And then when we discovered this violin connection to bass music, we started playing it. And it's, it's just totally exciting to get to do it. And my big dream, I don't know about Caitlin, but Mine is that ultimately almost all the bass groups, the dance groups around the American <coughs> West will not include just the violin and the pandero, but I mean the accordion and the pandero, but a violin too. And they're so beautiful together. And now with electricity, there's no problem. This violin can be as loud as she wants to make it. You know, so if you have a volume issue out of doors, you just crank it up. And I actually have learned how to play softly. So I can do that too. Um, you can tell about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So our case, uh, I had this fantasy. I, I collect bagpipes from around the world. Every country has bagpipes. In France alone, there's 80 different kinds. Little ones, big ones. There's one I have one that's about yay big. Um, this one comes from uh, Gascony, which is adjacent to the northeast, north a little bit of the Basque country, the current Basque country, with people who are genetically related to the Basques. But their language had 
change become a, an amalgam of, I guess it was Languedoc, Languedoc, the yeah. southern <laughs> French language, and with old Basque words mixed in and everything. But they played this kind of bagpipe. It's pretty unusual. It, the, the chitter part of it is much, it's very similar to the alborca. Just this part right here. Anyway, uh, I fantasized that, 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 that they, I wonder if they play together. But then I came across on my, the place where I worship on the weekends, it, it was YouTube. <laughs> and I came across the music, it's my religion. So I came across a YouTube video of this man archives from there playing with four people playing this instrument, the boha, which is the little bagpipe of Gascony. That's great. Yeah. That's good. So I guess we'll play it a little. We'll play it a little bit. Yeah. Here, check the tune. Ooh. Yeah, this is a big deal. You're getting to watch tuning one of these. It may take a while. Daniel, play me that. social dance. That's analogous to a, a two-step, a waltz, a polka, salsa, cumbia, any kind of couple social dance that you might see in North American communities. That's the most popular of those kind of dances in the Basque Country. They're often just done in big circles of people. You see them in small villages, in big cities, in plaza, at people's private parties. And the dancers will often be in that circle. Is this all tangled up? will be in that circle, and they're going around the circle moving as they do this, and then sometimes when they're long, really long, two dancers will look at each other from across the circle, and they'll go out and cross it, and maybe do some little improvisational, big time, fancy steps around each other, and then go back into the lines, the circle, and somebody else will come. So they can go on a long time. And people of all ages do them. It looks pretty aerobically demanding, but Many of the older people just keep dancing them their whole lives, and they simply calm the steps down a little, still do them with the same rhythm, and often really great beauty, even if they're not as bold as some of the younger dancers might be. <laughs> We're going to play you one more. This is called Agurra. Agurra is often something that Basque events open with. We're going to finish with it. It means greetings, 
And it's a song that is meant to commemorate important occasions of transformation or of motion from one thing to another. So it might be played at a wedding, a birth, a christening. Um, it could be played for a funeral, mass too, or crossing into another realm. It's played maybe for the opening of a new building to celebrate something like that or a community event or somebody in your community does something beautiful and you think important and you want to honor the person. So it, it often marks this beginning. Uh, we're going to play it at the end tonight, but because I think endings and beginnings are pretty close to each other and the endings of one thing are the beginnings of something else. So I hope very much that this has given you some pleasure. And I hope that it means maybe a beginning of an interest in other things Basque, too, that you will learn about in life. And maybe we can come back here and play some more for you someday. So this is Agurra. <laughs>